I real quick uh, give you a little background on Dive Lab because a lot of people probably don't know what Dive Lab is. But Dive Lab's a private company. Uh, it's uh, a test facility that was put together originally uh, for Kirby Morgan Diving Systems out of California. Bev Morgan, the owner of Kirby Morgan, always wanted to have a test facility where he tests his equipment. We started it in the, in the late 90s in Panama City. It kind of grew. Our main function for Dive Lab is to, to test all the Kirby Morgan equipment, mostly the helmets and uh, full face masks. Aside from that, it kind of grew and, and we turned into a, a training facility. We do all the Kirby Morgan dealer training there. And uh, we also have training for commercial divers all over the world, schools. Uh, it's really grown quite a bit. We do a lot of training. The other thing, we do a little bit of manufacturing. We do specialty manufacturing, which has also grown. We build a small oxygen rebreather for the Navy submarine program. We build, uh, a, couple, we build a couple of variations of surface supplied diving systems. And then we do a lot of little specialty work. So it's, it's grown quite a bit. But our, our main, my main function is to uh, test equipment. We've got a pretty large facility. We've got about 23,000 square feet. About almost half of that's uh, air conditioned and, and controlled. We've got a lot of outside storage. We've got a lot of inside storage. And, and it continues to grow. We've got a, a fairly large machine shop, so we can do a lot of different types of, of work in-house, as well as a lot of fiberglass and prototyping. We work real close with Kirby Morgan. We have our test facility. Kirby Morgan also has a test facility out in California. They've got a 100-meter ANSI system out there, as well as a smaller test system. We've got a 200-meter system at Dive Lab. We've also got a, some other test facilities. We've got a couple other chambers. We've got a manned test tank, and it goes on and on. Our main test. Uh, unmanned test facility that we use is the ANSTI system. And ours is, uh, it looks a little messy there, but it's always a mess, so it, I guess it's not going to matter. But we can do a broad range of testing, and from CO2, washout, canister durations. Uh, but most of ours, our, our work is concentrated on the helmets and masks. We don't normally do work for private companies, or outside, I should say. We're primarily there for Kirby Morgan. We do do work for some of the other manufacturers, some of the uh, military rebreather manufacturers. We've done work for them. We've done a lot of work directly for the military. We work real close with the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. But getting to what we're talking about here, we, we do do CE testing in Panama City on all the Kirby Morgan equipment. And I take a little bit different. I have a little bit different approach to this than probably our European counterparts in that we're the Yanks, we're, we're on this side of the pond, and we actually do the CE, we're doing the CE testing using the European standards. There's a lot of problems for us over here doing that. For one is when we first started to do this years ago, we put together our test facility. The notified body we were using, they didn't want to come over and, and, and witnessed the testing at our facility. They wanted it at their facility. We looked at all that. We had a lot better facility or, or a lot more capability than they had, and we wanted to do it at our place. So, so there were some problems. We ended up going to another notified body, and they came over, and they would witness the testing. So we could do just about everything at Dive Lab in Panama City. Well, we had a lot of problems there. So now we're on another notified body. And what I'm saying is the notified bodies do things a little different. We're going to get in and talk about that. But in the United States, we don't have any, uh, for commercial non-military manufacturing, there's no formal standards in the United States for the design, manufacturing, and testing of equipment. Now, I know a lot of people here are going, wait a minute, that's not true. Well, it is true as, as far as we have occupational regulations that if you're diving under if you're being paid to dive or you're an instructor, then you're going to fall under the OSHA standards. You're going to fall under occupational standards. But anybody here could make a rebreather. Anybody here could make a helmet and start selling it. And they're not really bound by any U.S. laws. Very, very few. The European Union has harmonized standards for manufacturing, testing of diving equipment sold in the EU. 
uh, you can't just go over there. Kirby Morgan can't, couldn't just take a helmet over there unless it was CE marked and sullied. They'd be breaking the law. And by today's standards, it's, it's, it's impractical and extremely dangerous to manufacture and sell equipment without, implying, without employing engineering, manufacturing, QA testing procedures. That's grown quite a bit. I don't think there's any manufacturers in the United States. We have the scuba industry itself. Uh, I don't think anybody's doing anything like that without employing all the modern standards. Uh, in the U.S., the diving equipment industry is primarily self-regulating. There's not a whole lot of intervention by the government until something goes wrong. The standards used in Europe are technical standards that set the minimum levels of safety for diving products. And then this allows the free movement of the equipment within the EU. The EU, you, the European Union has, has come together on these standards. And part of the reason for the standards is to ensure that these goods can be moved throughout the EU. The manufacturer of the product bears the sole responsibility for ensuring that the product has been tested and conforms to the standards and has gained the CE mark similar that's similar to like our UL approval over here. But our UL approval, we don't have UL approval for the diving equipment. In other words, we don't have the standards for the diving equipment like the electronics industry has in order to sell a piece of electronics equipment. It doesn't work the same way. Uh, in, in the, uh, well, getting back to, to what I was just saying on the manufacturing, there's a, there's a lot of equipment that gets manufactured and never gets sold in Europe. It's just strictly sold in the United States. It doesn't get the CE mark. If you do want to sell over there, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to go over there and do the full gauntlet of the testing. To obtain the, C to obtain the CE mark, the manufacturer must use a notified body. As Gavin was saying earlier, the notified body is appointed by governments within the EU. Each, comp each country uh, has, a, has a ministry. Uh, in, our, in our case, we're using an Italian notified body. So we had to get approved over here. Uh, Dive Lab had to get approved by the, the ministry department uh, of trade uh, to, be a, to be a test facility that the notified body could come over here and, and actually witness the testing. Uh, the notified bodies, they all work a little different. They're not all, they're not all quite the same in, in how they do business. And Unfortunately, most of the notified bodies that we've dealt with, in fact, there's very few notified bodies out there that know a lot about rebreathers or know a lot about surface supply diving or diving equipment in general. Typically, because diving is so small, those that have gotten into it, that have been working it for a while, they've gotten pretty good at it, but there's not very many of them. The notified body typically witnesses the testing, checks the test facilities, now, they check the test facilities to make sure, one, that test facilities got the capability to do the testing they have to do, but also to make sure that their equipment's right and that they, they go through their calibrations and that the, their gauges are calibrated, that they have all the basics that they need to have. They also review and inspect the test results and ensure uh, they conform to the standard. And then if everything is okay, then they end up awarding the CE mark to the equipment. Now, when we do this, for instance, at Dive Lab, it's an incredible amount of paperwork. We have our, our notified body comes once a year, sometimes twice a year. He's usually there for 10 days. We usually have two to three people. And they actually witness all the testing. Now, quite often, we do the testing. I'll do testing for weeks ahead of time to have all this fresh data. Or sometimes the testing's been done months before on a particular piece of equipment. And I always, I always try to have all this testing done, and I have it set aside. But then we still have to redo the testing again when they get there. They want to see it all. So generally what I do is I lay out what I've done. I put it off to the side. And we go ahead and we test the equipment. We do all the various tests, whether it's CO2 washout, uh, hydrostatic imbalance testing, whatever. And then as we, as we compile the test results, I always take the other tests that we had previously done and I lay it down there so they can do a comparison. That way they got a good warm fuzzy feeling that what we've been doing is, is correct. Drafting of European standards is carried out by technical committees. Uh, Gavin and uh, 
Ian Hemmings is here. They sit in on, on all these diving standard committees. Um, the standard committees are pretty much, it's a European thing. We can't get in on the standards committee. We're not part of the EU. Uh, I work a lot. I work real close with Ian Hemmings. I'm always calling him up with all my problems and asking for his advice. I've called Gavin on numerous occasions, asking him to make interpretations. The standards as they are sometimes need a little bit to, uh, at least for us Yanks, to understand the, the mindset sometimes. Uh, like we were saying, the standards are not perfect. I can pull a whole bunch of things right now, and I, and I talk about it all the time. Ian and I were discussing it last night. There's areas in there that definitely need some work. Uh, but that, that'll probably always be the case. One of my biggest heartburns with the standards is there needs to be some kind of an accounting system when they draft a standard that documents where a particular part of the standard came from. In other words, there's not a lot of history of how and why the standard is the way it is. And I know that's a mute point. We've talked about it a lot. But um, I just have a hard time with it sometimes because there are some parts of the standard they draw from another standard. And they'll only use verbatim a piece of it. They'll leave the rest of it out, and then they'll apply it to this other equipment. And so all of a sudden, you find out that, wait a minute, they only took a piece of this. And then what about the rest of it? Why doesn't that apply? If this applied, why doesn't the rest of it apply? So that's an area that, that I have a problem with sometimes. Like I said, we don't have a lot of say in it. Um, Kirby Morgan probably makes 90% of the helmets sold worldwide. And back when they were drafting the uh, surface supply standard for uh, helmets, we tried to get in on the committee through the IMCA Association uh, because Kirby Morgan's a, a member of IMCA, we couldn't get in on it. So it's kind of a shame in a way when you look at a, a company like Kirby Morgan that has that kind of expertise and background, they're not even allowed to sit in on a standards committee that actually controls surface supply diving. That would have been good. Uh, I don't know what the future is going to bring in the United States as far as test houses go. We don't normally do any testing for private companies as far as rebreathers go, that may change in the future. There's just not a whole lot here. There's not a lot in the United States where you can get that done. Um, the, uh, the Moving down the list here, not all notified bodies interpret or operate in the same manner. That's a, that's a really big problem. When you go to the notified body, it's real important. Go to somebody that you know has got some CE testing done before because they're going to be able to point you in the right direction. Uh, when you get to a notified body and they really don't understand what you're talking about or they don't understand how to do it, you've got a big problem. Gaining CE mark on a, on a breathing apparatus it is really complex. There's a lot of things involved. And uh, the amount of paperwork is, it can be mind-boggling. And it's very expensive. Every new piece of equipment that, that you get CE marked becomes a cash generating item for the notified body. In other words, every year they come back, and like, like for instance for us this year, they're coming back for probably seven or ten days. And they'll look at all, they like to look at all the Kirby Morgan equipment, but there's too much of it. So they pick out so many pieces of equipment and they have us do retesting and retesting and retesting. And, and I, I get so frustrated sometimes because I go, well, how many times do you have to check the field of vision of a helmet or mask to realize that it's the exact same as it was the last time you tested it because nothing's changed on it? But quite often we have to do that. Same thing with CO2 washout, okay? They want to see the same test over and over and over. So it gets a little frustrating because we have a lot of equipment. And every time we get a new piece of equipment CE marked, then they have to do testing on that equipment each year. So now each year, the cost keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So that's another thing to keep in mind. When you get your rebreather CE marked, it requires, regardless of whether you're ISO 9000 or not, it still requ requires not only quality or audits of, of your process, but it also requires testing audits. And uh, if, you can find a if you can find a test facility overseas, like, like Ian Hemmings does testing, and 
a lot of times you can work it out a lot better over there. It seems to flow a lot better. If you're a manufacturer, and this is, you know, this is hard for me to, to understand how anybody can build a rebreather without having their own test facility. Uh, it's not cheap. It's expensive. But once you got it, it's like having your own airplane with an unlimited credit card for gas. You can go anywhere you want to go. Uh, but it's not a, not a real easy thing for a lot of people to put together. I know originally when we were doing it, we were going to build our own system, and we ended up, we were in the U.K. about 15 years ago, and we went over and visited Ian Hemmings at Anstey and walked in the door, and there's this big, beautiful stainless steel pressure vessel. And he gave us a tour of the system, and it wasn't 15 minutes. He wasn't even halfway through it, and Bev says, well, is this one for sale? And Ian said, yeah. He said, well, we'll just buy this one. How quick can you deliver it? So about three or four months later, we had our system. And uh, it was so good, we ended up buying another one, a, a much bigger one, a 200-meter system with all the, all the bells and whistles. But it's expensive. And um, if you're going to be doing if you're going to be doing this as a living, making diving equipment, making rebreathers, if you don't have your own test facility or you don't have access to one, it'll make it really tough and expensive. A few pictures there. We, like I said, we do a lot of different kinds of testing. We do a lot of, lately we've been doing noise, a lot of noise testing on the helmets. We do helium testing. That's our little makeshift helium reclaim system there, which uh, I'm kind of proud of. It works really good. We, we actually exhaust the helium. In open circuit, we go through a couple thousand cubic feet of helium in a matter of minutes. Because when you're diving at 400 feet open circuit and you're dumping, you're breathing at 75 liters a minute, all that helium goes to the top of the chamber and it's going out of the chamber, goes in those bags, gets collected in the bags, and then the compressor puts it back in the banks. And then we go back afterward and we, we sort it out and, and tweak the mix however we have to. That's all I got. Any questions? John, can we just... Yes, uh, Jill Heinerth. Um, I guess the elephant in the room is that uh, currently in, a, in our mature marketplace here, we have units in North America that are being sold untested. We have consumer base that is uninformed, doesn't understand the details of testing and are buying units because it felt good in the swimming pool. <laughs> We have a, a lack of reporting and transparency of test results by many manufacturers or a lack of standardized reporting of tests by manufacturers. And then top that with an internet that um, reports anecdotal feats of survival to uh, unbelievable durations that uh, are far beyond CE tests. So, you know, in my ideal world, I'd love to see every manufacturer being, you know, quite transparent about a certain number of tests, including things like canister durations, all on the same specifications. I mean, it's like buying a car. We, we, we know what our fuel gauge is and the miles per gallon on a, on a consistent testing basis, and I'd like to see work of breathing also reported on a, on a consistent basis. So my question to, to you both is, what do you think the consumer public deserves to know? What should a manufacturer transparently put on their website for consumption by someone that's interested in buying a rebreather? I think I'd divide that into two aspects. And part of that is, is a little knowledge a bad thing or not? One of the things that the consumer needs to know is they need to have some confidence that this unit is fit for purpose, is safe, and will do what he wants to do. And I think there is a, a requirement for a universal way of presenting that. The other is there are some aspects of dive parameters which the user needs to know to be able to plan and conduct dives. I mean, you mentioned that the classic is canister endurance. One of the things with the standard is it gives you a very standard set of conditions for defining the endurance, and then within the European standard, the manufacturer should give you that data so that you can compare one with another and your uh, aspects. So I would define it in, in two, as two bits, just to reiterate that. There needs to be confidence that it's fit for purpose and where you can take it. And then there needs to be enough hard numbers for somebody to plan 
and conduct a safe operational dive. Now, the, the last rider on that is, should you give worker breathing? You know, if I said the worker breathing on a, a unit is 1.9 joules per litre, how many divers really know what that means? Or, it has been tested and it's proven to a standard and it is okay. And, you know, I leave that to the user community. Which do you really want? But think of everyone, not just the leading edge people who know the detailed physiology. You know, if you give 1.9 joules per litre, you've got to know what it means. Do you know what an elastance of 7 kilopascal joules per litre is? And that's the danger of giving numbers that they start being used incorrectly. Um, thank you. So can I take the, the first part of your answer as an endorsement that manufacturers should be posting their data, say, on canister endurance on the CE standard as opposed to reporting with perhaps other gases or other depths that make their numbers look better and difficult for the consumer to compare? Uh, it's, yeah, I would agree that they should give you the standard test result. Now, if they went, want to take it a step further, then that's up to them. But you should be able to have apples with apples. Thank you. Mark Caney, the European standard you mentioned, the EN1443, is well known and certainly seems to serve its purpose within Europe. It's understandable that non-European manufacturers are a little reluctant to embrace it because, of course, they have no input in subsequent changes or the evolution of that standard. Would there be any merit in considering developing an ISO standard using this as a basis? Let me answer that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not involved in, in, in writing any of the standards, but like I said, I have a lot of frustration in looking at it. They are working on ISO standards right now that are going to be used for diving. The current standard, the European standard, 14143 is probably the best thing that you could possibly use out there right now by any means. It covers everything. There's certain aspects of it that I don't particularly agree with, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth doing or it doesn't mean that it's not a good test. It's just there's certain things. I think in the United States we need to look at that because right now it, it supersedes anything the military does, I think, overall because it covers every aspect of it. it there, we don't have any or anywhere close to it. I, I can't even, uh, if you look, it's not just like that for rebreathers. It's the same thing for, for scuba. It's the same thing for surface applied diving. We do not have standards when it comes to that. So right now I say we use that and as it evolves and becomes an ISO standard, it should hopefully only get better. It's just, just to pick up on that, it was debated within the European standards community whether the development of this standard should be transferred to ISO. And, you know, being quite honest, the European standards body decided not to do that. And the reason they decided to not to do that is several fold. The first one is any of you have known how long it takes. It is a nightmare getting all the Europeans with a similar culture to agree on something. It takes years to put this together. Plus, when you're going to three international meetings a year, for us, it's okay to sort of go to Berlin and Paris and London. If you start having to go to Tokyo and Sydney and Rio uh, and Washington or whatever, the okay. costs go up or, or wherever. Um, so it was deliberately kept within Europe. I think if there is a push from outside Europe to move it to ISO, then that is something which could occur now, but it's costly and it takes time. Thank you. Uh, by the way, having attended many of those European standard meetings, I would uh, draw exception to that thing that there are similar cultures, but still. <laughs> Morten Silvanius, Swedish Navy. Uh, I would like to just mention that we are accredited test house for worker breathing, canister duration, and practical Closer to the mic, please. Yeah. I would like to mention that we are uh, accredited test laboratory according to EN standard 14143, work of breathing, canister duration, and uh, practical performance. And I uh, also agree uh, with you that the cost for being accredited is discussable, uh, as you both mentioned. And 
you already answered this almost, Mr. Anthony, but uh, what challenges do you see with the, the decision making in the European Standard Committee? I mean, what improvements could we have in the decision? There are a couple of years between every revision. How could we improve it? I think Mark Caney has, has just almost given the, the answer to that. The problem is, within Europe, there are, there are actually many different cultures. And in fact, there is, a, let's say, a, a slight north-south divide. There's not so much culture, but the north of Europe is cold water diving and the south of Europe is Mediterranean. And getting compromise between that takes time. And I don't think we're going to be able to accelerate that. So you don't uh, have a solution to improve this? Uh, to, you don't to, think it's possible? To, not to speed it up, no, unfortunately. Our last question. Hi, Seb Chander from the UK. Um, just first a comment. Hi, Mike. Um, I would encourage anyone um, who's around to go up and visit his facility. I was up there a couple of weeks ago doing a tech course. Fascinating place, and Mike's very happy to share his philosophies on CE and the, the right to carry firearms. <laughs> The question I had for Gavin was, you produced earlier the risk matrix that we see a lot in um, the HSE territory and cited the one in 10,000 acceptable incidents. I was wondering what the denominator for that is, if it's one in 10,000 dives or one in 10,000 units produced. I'm not quite sure. Okay, it, it's, that's always the big thing. The, the denominator there is this is for the use of one single rebreather for one year. Okay? Now, the unknown factor of that is how many dives that rebreather will do in a year. It could do one, you know, it could do a thousand. And so that's the slight unknown. But it's based on really a, a standard logic that it might be used for two or three dives every weekend, that sort of model. So that is the concept. So it's one rebreather for a year and used something like 50, 100, 150 dives. And that that would produce one fatality in 10,000 users? In, well, it's a probability. So arguably, for a single rebreather, if it was used that, it would have to be used for that many years. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Leon is our last question. <laughs> Leon, Scamhorn Interspace Systems. Having gone through the CE process with the Megalodon and to be the only American company to currently hold a CE on a, uh, on the, on a U.S. CCR, I have to, as a personal witness, it's a very rigorous test. It, in my professional opinion, it does prove a fit for purpose, but it does not prove the diver is fit for purpose. Okay? I feel the standard should also be an ISO standard, so to, be, to get the CE mark or, or to meet the harmonized European standard, you have to be an ISO company. And so I feel that if it's an ISO standard, that is one more tool. Uh, when you get audited once or twice a year, the auditor can come in and see your test results, and that's part of your quality assurance. Uh, and so I feel that's important. That should happen. To start getting the safety culture turned around in the United States and North America, that I feel every manufacturer should prove their product is fit for purpose, and that's one thing that we've done in RESA to join RESA. You have to meet some certain requirements, and that is one of them is that you prove your product has uh, met some basic worker breathing, scrub duration, uh, hydrostatic lung loading. You know, those are one of the things, and you can see who are on the RESA members and you can see why they're on there because they're either they're CE marked or they've proven in some fashion that their product has had third party testing uh, by a, a test house. So I think every, uh, I think the United States should, the dive industry in the U.S. should adopt the 14-14-3 uh, harmonized standard as its standard for proving fit for purpose for rebreathers. And all of you are in here are diving EN 250, you're diving an a open circuit, look there and it says CE, there's a mark on it. Same thing on a rebreather, just look for the CE mark and it's proven that it's met the standard which is a great standard. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank